Last week, I started talking about policy instruments, um, and I talked at greater length than planned uh, about direct regulation and about voluntary agreements, um, and therefore I did not have time to talk about uh, COS, COS theorem in theory and in practice, and COS bargaining. Um, so that was the plan for last week, and then this week uh, I'm going to talk about taxes, subsidies, and tradable permits, and the difference between them. And COS sort of sits in between the sort of market approach to regulation and the direct regulation voluntary agreement uh, type of approach. Uh, so it, it's not that bad that we are where we are. Um, <clears throat> The uh, Coase theorem goes back, in a way, to uh, Ronald Coase, who you see here. Um, this uh, is actually half uh, of his Nobel Prize. Uh, the other half is for the theory of the firm. Um, and it is a bit peculiar because uh, Coase never wrote this up as a theorem. He uh, did this in a paper published in 1960. Um, in a completely qualitative uh, way. It's actually George Stigler uh, who dubbed the name Coase theorem, also the Stigler also never wrote it down as a theorem. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what is now known as the Coase theorem uh, says that the social optimum can be established, can be reached through bargaining between polluter and pollutee. Uh, that's the efficiency thesis, uh, and the outcome is the same regardless of the initial allocation of rights. Uh, that's the invariance uh, thesis. Now, the efficiency thesis of the Coase theorem is uh, essentially just the first fundamental uh, welfare theorem. That is, if you establish property rights uh, and people can trade freely uh, and informally uh, and rationally, then you will reach a Pareto optimum, right? And that is essentially what the Coase theorem is about, that you create or establish uh, who is the victim uh, and who is, or who is the polluter and who is the polluter. Um, and somehow there can be uh, bargaining over the level of pollution. Um, <clears throat> the uh, second half um, of uh, the Coase theorem, that the Pareto uh, optimum that you reach is the same regardless of how you allocate uh, the, uh, the property rights. That sounds very much like the second welfare theorem. Second welfare theorem says that if you reallocate property rights, you reallocate the initial endowments uh, of agents in an economy, then you will find a Pareto optimum. Coase actually established that you find the same Pareto optimum. So this is a substantial sharpening of the second uh, welfare theorem. Um, <clears throat> so uh, how does this work? Uh, let's do it uh, graphically. Um, what we have on the horizontal actions are emissions. And in, in the example I'm giving, it's emissions of noise. Um, and on the vertical axis, we have some indicator of uh, the price of the willingness to pay. Uh, we have a marginal benefit curve in green. We have a marginal cost curve in brown. We have an optimal uh, level of noise, Q star. And we have an optimal price for uh, noise pollution, uh, P star, right? This is what a social planner would do, right? Either impose this quantity Q, or impose that price P. Um, now, so that, that's the social optimum. And we've been through this uh, in the lecture on cost-benefit analysis and target setting. Now let's um, consider uh, The following situation. I was studying the next slide because I never know what order they come. Um, let's consider uh, that you're living in uh, a flat or an apartment and a um, new neighbor moves in in the apartment uh, directly uh, next to you. 
and he plays the saxophone and he's not very good uh, at playing the saxophone, right? And he also likes to play saxophone late in the evening and early uh, in the night and you do not like that situation uh, at all. Now suppose that you live in a, an apartment building where there are no rules about noise or maybe there are rules about noise but the landlord does not enforce them, right? And some of you uh, have probably lived in a situation like this. Now what can you do, right? Um, so the brown curve are essentially the enjoyment that the saxophone player has from playing the saxophone. And if he plays very little, uh, then actually the first couple of minutes are great fun. Uh, and then as he plays more and more and more and more, he gets tired and gets fed up and playing the same uh, thing uh, again. And his lungs uh, get tired and his lips start to hurt. At a certain point, he stops playing, right? That is where the brown curve, the marginal benefit, it's zero. At this point, there is no benefit anymore for the saxophone player uh, to continue to play the saxophone. Uh, the green curve is your annoyance. And at first, you know, yeah, it's okay, right? But then he just keeps playing and he keeps playing and he's been playing for an hour and he's been playing for two hours and you really want to go to sleep, right? Um, and you get very, very annoyed, right? So and you get increasingly annoyed. And that's what the green curve tells you, that the marginal damages by the noise increase as the level of noise uh, increases, right? <clears throat> so that is what the two curves denote. Now suppose that we're somewhere here, right? Uh, at this point, you are really, really annoyed. And your saxophone playing neighbor is actually not that interested anymore. So you could imagine that you go knock on his door and say, I will give you five pounds if you please stop playing now, right? And he would probably say, I've been playing for two and a half hours. Five pounds sounds like a good, de a good deal. Actually, I would accept one pound as compensation. And as long as you're somewhere here, you can stri strike a mutually advantageous deal. Because your annoyance at the margin of increased uh, saxophone playing is greater than his enjoyment at the margin of more saxophone playing, right? So he would happily accept compensation to play a little bit less. That would be the brown amount, and you would be happy to pay that. That's the green amount, and the green amount exceeds the brown amount, right? So you can strike a deal that is mutually advantageous. Now, that is true here. That is still true here, right? The green line is still above the brown line. It's no longer true here. So as long as you are above the optimal amount of noise Q star, you are prepared to pay more than your neighbor would be willing to accept to play less. Right? And you end up in this particular point here, and the money that's changing hands is P, P star. <clears throat> now, let's suppose that there are rules in the house about making noise after 10 o'clock. Right? Uh, so you have a right to silence. This is your starting point. But at that point, actually, it's 10 o'clock, your neighbor just got home from work or something, uh, and he really wants to play the saxophone, but he's not allowed. So he could come knock on your door and say, what if I give you eight pounds if I can play for 15 minutes? And you won't tell the landlord, please? And you'd say, well, He's willing to pay quite a lot, and actually I don't mind, at 10 o'clock at night, uh, 15 minutes of saxophone playing because I was doing uh, something silly anyway, and it does not really bother me, right? So as long as you're here, he is willing to pay more to play the saxophone one additional minute than you are willing to accept in compensation for one additional minute of saxophone playing, right? And that continues here, you're still willing to accept uh, the deal, it's still mutually advantageous. It stops here, if you're at this point, he is only willing to give you uh, four pounds, but you say, no, I would need six pounds for an additional minute, right? 
So also if your starting point is silence or a right to silence, then you will also end up in point Q star and the money that is changing hands, hands is P star. Right? Um, now that is the Coase theorem. And essentially it says if you complete the market by either assigning a right to make as much noise as you would want or by assigning a right to silence and then some sort of transaction or bargaining going on, then the people bargaining can reach what is the social optimum. And it does not matter who you give those property rights to, whether it's a right to silence or a right to noise, you reach the same point. That is the uh, Coase uh, theorem. Now, um, there are many assumptions behind this. Um, and a few of those are given here. Uh, there is no attachment to the status quo, right? The utility functions are smooth in, uh, the, in the current situation, in the status quo. If you want to know more about this, uh, do behavioral economics next term. Um, zero income elasticities. That is, money changes hands, but that does not change your demand for anything. Right? So the brown, brown curve and the green curve do not shift if money changes hands. That's uh, zero income elasticities. And I was talking about relatively small sums of money, so this is not implausible. Um, all relevant information should be revealed in the bargain, right? As soon as somebody knows more than the other, uh, the thing can break down. Um, but perhaps the most important uh, assumption, and that is why he really won the Nobel Prize, is the assumption of zero transaction costs. These bargains take place without anybody exerting any effort, without anybody spending any time the time spent negotiating, arguing with your neighbor uh, and a saxophone does not affect anything, right? And the real meaning of the Coase theorem says that, well, if you have zero transaction costs, plus all these other assumptions, then you actually don't need a government to step in. What you can have is that, yeah, we just we assign property rights. We tell you, you have the right to pollute, or you have the right to a pristine environment, one of the two. You have the right to silence or the right to make noise, one of the two. As soon as that is done, the government can step back. The only thing the government needs to do, and this is a strict libertarian position, the only thing the government needs to do is define property rights and enforce property rights. And after that, the market will take care of uh, everything. Um, and if true, you don't need environmental regulation, right? You just need to say, well, you have the right to a pristine environment. And if somebody wants to pollute your environment, then they have to compensate you. And then they won't, right? Um, or they will compensate you. Um, so that is the uh, insight uh, that won him half the Nobel Prize, right? The other half very similar uh, with the theory of the firm. Um, now, this may strike you as completely and totally unrealistic, right? This is a nice theoretical result that if you have complete property rights and zero transaction costs and zero income elasticities, then we don't need government intervention. But can this actually work in uh, reality? Um, <clears throat> And the answer is a qualified uh, yes. Um, so uh, the first thing that people tried uh, was redo these sort of games in experiments with groups of students. And this was actually uh, at the very start uh, of experimental uh, economics. Uh, and most of these experiments show that actually, yeah, the Coase theorem sort of works. Um, and many of the very strict assumptions have been relaxed in these experiments, asymmetric information and those sort of things have been introduced. Um, 
and Co still sort of works, right? So generally that is what you would find in experiments. Um, now you may recall what we did last Tuesday, <laughs> um, where we actually, you guys were bargaining over an externality, right? There were people who were taking water uh, for irrigation and that meant that other people did not have water for irrigation. And so that was the first uh, three rounds uh, that you guys played. And then you could actually bargain over these things. Um, and theory <laughs> and all preceding experiments uh, show that that should move you closer to the social optimum. Uh, but this is what you guys did. Uh, so 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, uh, and three o'clock sessions. In blue, you're looking at the first three rounds where it was a dictator game, right? Somebody just takes the water and the guys and girls downstream just had to take it. Um, and you see two things. One, that the blue dots are actually above the selfish optimum. That is, <laughs> some of you guys played nice with others rather than playing selfish with... Uh, the way it is, right? Um, and then in the pinkish, you guys were supposed to become more cooperative. And of the 12 dots that you see there, only one actually worked. <laughs> that was in the noon group, uh, the second uh, round with bargaining. Actually, you see a decisive move towards the social optimum. Well done, guys. Uh, but then, of course, in the round immediately after, you guys reverted to <laughs> being selfish cons, essentially. Um, um, <laughs> apologies for the language. Uh, and then uh, the fourth group also got uh, just a tiny little bit closer. So last week's experiment completely failed in improving um, welfare. Um, what you guys did do in most groups, except for group two, is actually make the water allocation fairer, right? So at the top row, what you're seeing uh, was that in group one, the first player took all the water and left very little for the second. Uh, but in the second, uh, no, uh, yeah, that's the top, right? Um, two for player one, point eight one for player two, that is without bargaining and then with bargaining, you actually found that the average water allocation was 1.33 versus 1.24, right? Much more egalitarian water distribution. The guys upstream and girls upstream did not take all the water. And you would see the same uh, in group uh, three, right? Much more egalitarian. Group four, they actually played with four people in the group rather than with two. You also see that in the sort of the selfish round, the blue rounds, uh, player four was left with almost no water. Uh, but with bargaining, they actually got a lot of water, right? It was much more equal uh, distribution. Um, and group two uh, was the exception to this. So with you guys, <laughs> Co sort of worked, but in a different way than theory predicted. Uh, but that's uh, the way it is. Um, there's also been many attempts at using Cosian style bargaining in the real world outside uh, the artificial uh, environment of uh, university uh, laboratories or online laboratories. Um, and I'm going to split that into um, two parts. One where the polluter pays and the second where the pollutee uh, pays. Uh, and the clearest example of Cosian style bargaining where it's actually the polluter uh, pays uh, goes to uh, Min de Potas del Zas, uh, which are the uh, potassium mines in uh, the Alsace, right? Um, and what they have done since um, 1931, in order to get the potassium out, you need to treat the ores with uh, chlorides. Uh, and what they've done since 1930, what they did before 1931, is dump it in the groundwater until the local uh, farmers started protesting and ever since they've dumped it in the Rhine, uh, which is very convenient because then the water just takes it to the Netherlands, right? Which is a different country, you don't need to worry uh, about that. Um, 
So that had been going on uh, from 1931 onwards, um, and that caused increasing rows internationally uh, with uh, downstream countries, and uh, Netherlands and Belgium uh, in particular. Um, High-level diplomatic uh, rows, including that ambassadors were recalled uh, from Paris and that sort of thing, like really high tension uh, at a post-war European scale, high tension between uh, these countries. And that in 1972, after a few decades of negotiations, uh, led to an agreement uh, on cost sharing for emission reduction. Um, and that was that uh, the Netherlands would pay some a third or so uh, of the costs of cleaning up the potassium mines in France. Uh, France would pick up 30% of the bill, uh, and then perhaps surprisingly, uh, Germany also chipped in. Uh, Germany is not downstream, but upstream, but Germany also dumped uh, chlorides in the Rhine for their, from their industry. And they thought it would be cheaper to pay the friends to clean up their mess than to clean up the mess in Germany, right? That is why the Germans chipped in. And the same is true for the Swiss. They thought it would be cheaper to let the friends clean up the mess rather than clean up their own mess. So this was the um, initial deal. Um, and that deal was uh, revised 20 years later in 1991. Um, the Swiss dropped out because they had closed one of their plants. Uh, the contribution of the Netherlands was essentially diverted back to the Netherlands for cleaning up uh, uh, drinking water, water purification. And since 1991, the cleanup of the potassium mines has been paid almost in full by the French and the Germans, by the polluters by the people who put the chlorides in the Rhine. This was done through bargaining. No courts uh, were involved. This was all done before the European Union acquired substantial powers in environmental regulation. This was essentially an agreement between sovereign nations talking as equal. And as a result, the people who caused the pollution picked up the bill for cleaning up the pollution. Right? Um, now, this is a rare case. It's actually one of the very few cases uh, that I'm aware of where cohesion bargaining leads to the polluter paying for uh, the reduction of the damage. This is essentially where um, <clears throat> the saxophone player, where you have the right to silence and the saxophone player pays you to be allowed to make noise, right? Uh, that is essentially the situation where we're in here. Uh, much more common is the other uh, situation where the polluti uh, pays. Uh, and that goes back to uh, this guy here, um, King John, right? Uh, so at the top you're looking at not King but Prince John, uh, Lackland. Uh, when I was young, and of course this is what he looked like uh, when you uh, were young. Um, so this goes back to a very old case. Uh, we're in the early 13th century, um, when kings were still judges as well and made rulings. Uh, and what had happened was that uh, Jordan the Miller wanted to increase the power of his water mill. Uh, and had to increase the size of his reservoir, and in the process had flooded uh, the land of his neighbor, Simon of Merston. Um, and Simon did not like that, took uh, Jordan to court, uh, and the king ruled that, yes, this was unjust. You cannot just go in and be a nuisance to your neighbor, right? You cannot just flood somebody else's land if uh, you feel like that. Um, now, this is <laughs> a while ago, right, that this happened, more than 700 years, 750. Actually, it's, uh, I think, I think it's 800 years ago, that is, no, it was 1263, not 1223. Um, so, 760 years ago, so now it is commonplace, right, that you cannot just go in and be a nuisance to others, but this was actually when it was first established in common law that you cannot. Um, it's 1201, sorry. 
Uh, I should have just read my slides, right? And so it is much more common that the polluter pays. That is what we think is normal. Um, and this holds not just within countries, uh, but in 1938, the Canadians, no, uh, the United States took Canada to court because the fumes of a trail smelter just across the border of Washington State, uh, that is in Canada, in British Columbia, uh, blew over and damaged the crops of the farmers in Washington. And the US said, we don't like this, this is a nuisance. And uh, this was uh, brought to court. And in 1938, the judge rules, no, you cannot be a nuisance to your neighbors. Also, when your neighbors live across an international border, right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, and what we have seen as a result of rulings like these two is that definitely in the United States, chemical companies, power companies uh, that make electricity regularly buy out the people who are potentially or actually harmed by uh, their actions. Um, and sometimes they buy up uh, entire villages or just uh, individual houses. Um, sometimes this happens after an accident, sometimes this happened when there was almost an accident, uh, and sometimes it happens uh, because they anticipate uh, trouble. Um, now, you can sort of like see this as a cogent bargaining, uh, cogent bargain, right? They're arguing about who should compensate who and so on and so forth, but there's always sort of the threat of a lawsuit in the background, right? So it's not entirely close. Uh, but it comes uh, close uh, enough. Um, <clears throat> and it's not just in the United States that this happens. Also, if you look around uh, airports in Europe, but not in the United Kingdom, uh, you often see airports buying up houses near the airport so that the owners do not complain about the noise, right? Uh, we've seen this in the Netherlands, we've seen this in Germany, we've seen this in Norway. Um, these things happen. Uh, another example um, that is interesting for another uh, reason <clears throat> is um, when Nestle, that you know, um, no, when Vitel, that you know, um, started paying farmers to pollute less near its spring. So Vitel is one of those mineral water companies, they're now owned by Nestle. Um, and it's one of the brands of Nestle nowadays, but they actually started doing this when Vitel was still Vitel. Um, and there are very strict rules about what you can call mineral water. And they got it from groundwater. Uh, and there were these farmers in the area, in the catchment of their mineral waters, and they were using fertilizers uh, and pesticides and those sort of things. And that threatened the classification of Vitel's water as mineral, and that would mean a major loss uh, in revenue. Uh, the farmers were well within the legal limits of how much fertilizers and how much pesticides they applied. Um, so what Vitel did was it negotiated with these farmers and it essentially is paying them compensation for using less fertilizers, using less chemicals, their profits, the farmers' profits, are lower as a result, but the compensation uh, makes up uh, for that. They also provide technical support and so. Um, this case is, uh, is interesting um, because, strictly speaking, the Coase theorem is a bargain between two, a polluter and a pollutee. And in this case, we had one pollutee, Nestle, and a whole bunch of polluters, a whole bunch of farmers in their catchment. And they, that sort of creates a public goods problem, coordination between uh, the, uh, the, the farmers. And this coordination problem was essentially solved by the single, uh, the single polluter, right? 
Um, New York uh, City did something uh, very similar. They were troubled by what went on uh, upstate or rather upriver uh, in the Catskill, Delaware watershed where New York City gets most of its drinking water from. And essentially what they decided to do is turn the whole thing into a nature reserve and kick out all the farmers, buy out all the farmers. They had not legally the right to kick them out, they had to buy them out, right? Um, and they thought that was cheaper uh, than building a water treatment plant and getting the shit out. Um, internationally, we've also seen uh, this work with uh, Sweden and Finland, uh, who pay for the reduction of air pollution in the Baltic states, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, um, and in Poland. Um, and they tried it in Russia uh, as well, but this was in the Yeltsin uh, years, the early years of Putin, and it was just so corrupt that they gave up. Uh, the they could pay the Russians, but the money never went to <laughs> anything good. Um, similar things, uh, Japan had a similar experience trying to clean up things uh, in uh, China and places like the Philippines. Um, now, as I said, a key problem with the Coase theorem is that it works between two parties. Um, and when there's multiple parties on one side, you need to somehow work your way around that. In uh, Santa Maria, California, uh, the way this was coordinated is that the pollutees <clears throat> Um, pressured the, uh, I think it's the city council, uh, to step in and impose a tax on their own houses. And then that money was used to clean up uh, a feedlot for pigs, right? Uh, so that is one way of solving this coordination problem. Because essentially, if you have a whole bunch of pollutees and you're going to pay, um, then it's much easier when your neighbors pay and you don't, right? That is your, the rational solution there, that the others contribute to providing the solution, but you do not, and you somehow need to solve this coordination problem. In Santa Maria, they solve this by essentially getting the government involved. So it's, goes against the Coase theorem, right? It says you can sort it out by yourself. You don't need the government to step in. In this case, they needed the local government uh, to step in. Um, the uh, next two examples are without government intervention. Um, essentially, if you don't like uh, dolphins and um, other animals, other uh, sea mammals uh, that you think are charismatic and should be protected, if you don't like the damage that is done by fisheries to these species, then you could go and try and convince uh, fisher folk to stop fishing. But you come as a, a poor student and you can say, I can give you 10 pounds, right? And they will laugh in your face, right? Uh, so, lots of individuals would be willing to pay something against this, but each individual is, of course, well, most individuals do not have the purchasing power to actually change things. Uh, so, what uh, Nature Conservancy and the Environmental Defense Fund do is say, well, we're going to raise money from everybody who's concerned about this, and we're going to pull all that money, and then we're going to buy out, in this case, fishing rights and fishing gear. So we're essentially paying fisher folk to stay ashore and not to fish, right? Um, and that's been a fairly uh, successful. Nature Conservancy um, has done something very similar to protect migratory birds in, uh, uh, again, California, or that is where the protection took place. The migratory birds are, of course, everywhere. Um, 
they actually had a two-sided coordination problem. On the one hand, there were lots of people who worried about the birds, and uh, in this case, the concern was about the wetlands in California disappearing. And these birds fly from uh, the Arctic, stop over in California, and then fly to somewhere in the rainforest uh, in South America, um, and then uh, on the way back, and they need these wetlands for foraging. Uh, essentially refueling on the way. And if the wetlands are not there, then uh, these birds will be in trouble. Uh, so lots of people were concerned about that, were willing to contribute a little bit, and that is how uh, monies were collected. Uh, but then there was also a co coordination problem on the other side, and that was how do we get these wetlands back? And the solution that they came up with is that they organized an auction, a reverse auction even, uh, for rice farmers. And those birds come by twice a year for a short stop. And it so happens that at the time that the birds come, there is no rice in the fields anyway. But you have all the irrigation equipment because it's paddy rice. So they organized a reverse auction and they pay farmers to keep their, flan, uh, to keep their lands flooded a bit longer uh, in spring and keep the uh, flood the lands a bit earlier in uh, fall. I think it's actually the other way around. Um, and that is how they solve the coordination problem also on the supply side, right? So uh, no government involved. This is cohesion bargaining, not between two people, but between two groups of people with a pretty smart NGO in between to coordinate uh, these whole things. Um, now, what the impression you have got from me, and you will get a stronger impression of that uh, next term if you're still here, is that I'm not a big friend uh, of uh, environmental NGOs. Nature Conservancy is actually an exemption, uh, exception uh, to that. They are actually doing uh, great work. They have a, a very skilled team that sort of like is driving the sort of things that they're doing. <clears throat> um, and uh, to wrap up uh, this bit, and it took me 40 minutes, um, you can complete the market by assigning property rights. And as soon as you have a complete market, you're back in uh, first welfare uh, theorem uh, type uh, of environment. Um, and if COS is right, then it will find uh, a Pareto optimum. And the examples that I showed and the experimental evidence that I alluded to sort of suggest that even if you don't quite get to the Pareto optimum, there's still a welfare improvement. Um, that Pareto optimum does not depend on who has the property rights, whether you have the right to pollute or the right uh, not to be polluted. Um, and those stringent assumptions that I talk about, actually, you can work around that in practice and you still get some of the way there, right? Uh, the good thing about cost bargaining uh, is that it can be used to internalize the sort of externalities that are very hard to reach with uh, other forms of government intervention. Definitely, if you have a, a small group of people who are bothering each other, you really want the government to step in or would you like them to sort it out uh, amongst themselves? There's all sorts of sort of these micro uh, externalities where bargaining a la cause may actually be the solution to what you want to do. Um, it's 22. Um, I finished last week's lecture. Um, <laughs> I think I can do taxes um, of this week's uh, lecture, right? So, um, there we are. Um, I'm now going to talk about policy instruments where the government does step in but it's still all about the incentives uh, of people. And I'm gonna do so in uh, <coughs> four steps. Uh, I'm gonna talk about taxes, subsidies, tradable permits, uh, and then I'm gonna do a little bit taxes versus subsidies and taxes versus permits. 
Um, and given how late it is, I'm not going to do much uh, of uh, the comparison. So, uh, let's start with taxation. <clears throat> So what is an environmental tax? Essentially you pay, and we talked about environmental taxes before, that's why I can think I can do it in 10 minutes. Uh, you pay a charge or a levy or a penalty uh, for every unit uh, emitted or produced or consumed, right? That is essentially what an environmental tax is. Uh, the exact wording that you use depends on two things. How is the tax exactly levied? And then there's technical differences between levies and taxes and uh, uh, excises and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then there's also political constraints. In some countries you can use the word tax, in other countries you cannot use the word tax, right? And you need to think, as a politician, you need to come up with some uh, creative word spinning to get around the local prohibitions on certain words, right? Uh, but essentially it's all the same. You pay for your pollution, right? <clears throat> now, how does that work? Uh, we've looked at the cost-benefit diagram just a few minutes ago. We here have the marginal private gains uh, from emissions. Um, say we're using energy. Uh, if you use very little energy, your uh, gain at the margin is high. But the more and more energy you use, the warmer and warmer it gets in your apartment and the higher and the higher uh, the heating costs. Uh, so at a certain point, the extra heating costs do no longer compensate for, uh, or no, the uh, extra comfort does no longer compensate for the higher heating costs at the margin. And at this point you stop heating your house, right? That's Q prime. Um, <clears throat> and then we have the marginal uh, social losses uh, from the emissions that if you don't emit, they're very low. But the higher the emissions, the greater uh, the cost. Uh, and then the social optimum is this uh, level Q uh, prime, right? So this is unregulated emissions Q, uh, no, this is Q star and this is Q prime, right? So what happens if you impose a tax on emissions? Now you pay for every unit that you emit, so your costs and the margin go up and your private gains, therefore, from the emitting activity go down. Um, and we are in the orange situation here, right? Because the cost of energy has gone up. Simple as that, and therefore you use less of it, and therefore your emissions fall from Q prime to Q double prime. <clears throat> So this is what any environmental tax uh, would do. Uh, we also talked about the Pigou tax, right? Uh, that is actually it's also a tax. It increases the costs of emission, therefore decreases the private gains from emissions. Um, and if you reduce emissions to the optimal level, Q star, the tax that you impose is the Pigou tax, right? So any environmental tax reduces emissions, but only the Pigou tax reduces emissions to its social optimum, right? So a Pigou tax is an environmental tax, but an environmental tax is not a Pigou tax, right? <clears throat> Typically, we don't know uh, the uh, benefits or the costs uh, to the environment at the margin, so we are in this particular uh, situation. It's fairly straightforward, right? A tax increases the cost of the activity and therefore you do less of it, right? Uh, does this work in practice? Um, <clears throat> um, this has been dubbed the most popular tax in Europe. Um, and it is the plastic bag levy that was introduced in uh, Ireland. Um, and what they did in the year 2002 was that the minister introduced a uh, 15 cents, uh, this is in euros, uh, tax per bag uh, that people got in uh, the shops. Um, <clears throat> and the minister actually did this, uh, this was Noel Dempsey, uh, did this uh, against the will of the people. What you're looking at in the table is uh, a study of the willingness to pay 
four plastic bags. And uh, most people said, eh, I'm not, or uh, uh, for 40% of people said, no, I'm not willing to pay anything. Um, and then if you add a 27% uh, of people who were willing to pay uh, less than two cents, <laughs> uh, you actually see that nobody was willing to pay the 15 cents, right? And here we actually have the maximum in the survey was seven and a half cents and Dempsey just doubled uh, this. So this was a tax that was initially introduced against the will of the people. The reason for this was very simple politics. Um, the minister needed to raise money. Uh, it was a time of austerity. Um, and the minister did not just want to raise money in general for the government, uh, but this was a so-called earmarked tax. These tax revenues went to the Department for the Environment, not to the Treasury. And therefore, the minister had his own little slus fund as a result, right? That is why the minister said, we're going to do this, not because he wanted to be uh, popular. <clears throat> um, the uh, revenue for the tax was about 13 uh, million per year. Uh, the fixed cost of setting up the system, so they needed to buy some computers to administer the whole thing. They needed to train some civil servants, uh, was 1.2 million. Um, and uh, they also ran an awareness campaign that, yeah, this is really important and all these plastic bags end up in the environment and they don't kill turtles because we are uh, in Ireland. Uh, but they do look pretty badly in the, hats, uh, in the hats rows and some of them are eaten by seagulls and poor little seagulls and so on and so forth, right? And they ran an awareness campaign about how important this was uh, that added to the fixed cost. Uh, and then the variable cost, that's essentially the civil servants overlooking the whole thing uh, is around 350,000 per year. So from an administrative perspective, this makes money, right? So you get in uh, 13 uh, million and you pay uh, 0.3 million per year. So the annual profit is uh, 12 million and a bit, right? So that is, I mean, it's not a big sum. Uh, Ireland is not a big country. Uh, so this is, um, this is good. The reason that uh, the variable costs are so low is something that I talked about last week is that this is an excise, right? So recall that an excise is a tax that you pay when you buy something uh, and it's related to the physical characteristics of the thing. In this case, the number of bags. It's not the value, it's not a value added tax. It is proportional to the quantity in physical terms, right? And that's why it's an ex excise. Um, and people pay this at the supermarket checkout, right? Where you are already paying other excises if you buy alcohol or cigarettes or stuff like that, and where you already pay your VAT for most everything else, right? Uh, so it's easy enough uh, to set uh, this up. <clears throat> uh, it was also effective. Um, uh, so they did a before and after survey of plastic bags in the Irish landscape and they found uh, that the areas with no plastic litter increased by 21% and the areas with little litter uh, increased by 56%, so that is good. Uh, the, you may not know this, but occasionally they go through your rubbish to check what is in there. That is important for decisions about whether to incinerate or landfill and how to incinerate and how to landfill. People do go through your rubbish. It's not the most pleasant job in the world, but people do do this. Um, and what they found was that actually uh, plastic and household waste fell very substantially from a 5% to 0.2%. Uh, uh, so it's a very substantial drop in plastic in uh, waste. Uh, because apparently people used these bags once and threw them out and got loads of them. Um, <coughs> retailers increasing, initially unhappy, actually were actually very happy after the fact because people brought their own bags, so that actually reduces costs. Um, and uh, after the fact, uh, the public was very happy uh, as well. Recall that the initial uh, the sort of the before the fact survey said nobody's willing to pay for this and definitely not the 15 cents. Uh, 
uh, surveys after the fact actually show that 90% is happy with the environmental impact, 10% is neutral, nobody is negative, right? Nobody is really bothered by uh, the inconvenience of having to bring your own back. Well, it's not really inconvenient, right? Uh, nobody really worried about the expense or that it would delay things at uh, checkout. So people are actually pretty uh, happy. Now, I said that this was the um, most popular environmental tax in Europe, and it was, um, and it is a bit unfair. Um, Everybody copied Ireland, right? Uh, and other countries followed, actually South Africa followed, and so on and so forth. Here, it was actually Wales that went first, followed by Scotland and then England. Um, <clears throat> and it really is popular. Now, it is unfair uh, because actually it was Denmark who did this first, um, but the Irish are much better at PR uh, than the Danes are and therefore they got the credit uh, for this. Uh, the Danish tax also works very well. <clears throat> um, the situation in England is actually a little bit different than the situation in Ireland. And in Ireland, it is a tax that goes to the government or rather to the environment uh, ministry and they fund projects uh, from that. Um, in uh, England, actually it's not a tax, but it's a contribution to charity. So when you go to the Tesco's and you pay for your plastic bag, which you shouldn't do because you should bring your own bag, but suppose you forgot it, um, and you get a plastic bag from the supermarket and you pay for that, that money actually does not go to, uh, what's his name, Hunt, uh, but it goes, stays with Tesco's, and they have actually promised to give this to charity instead, <clears throat> a charity of their choice. Uh, so it is uh, different. Um, when the tax or the charitable contribution was first introduced, journalists paid attention that the money indeed went to charities as the supermarkets had promised, but that attention has waned. And also the Environment Agency is actually not nor is the, the revenue commissioners are actually paying attention that the supermarkets really donate all this money. So it's a bit unclear whether they do. What is clear is that you and I pay uh, at the checkout if we get a plastic bag, right? Um, and also here, it has substantially reduced plastic bag use to the benefit of the environment. Not just that there's less waste, but also we use less resources uh, and less greenhouse gas emissions as a result. Okay, <clears throat> that's it for now. After the break, in 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about subsidies and I'm going to talk about tradable uh, permits. Uh, next chapter is on subsidies. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, taxes when you have to pay to emit. Uh, a subsidy is essentially where you get paid not to emit. Uh, and the effect is the same in the short run. So I showed you this graph. This is what happened to your marginal private gains. If you have to pay a tax for everything you uh, do, then obviously your private gains fall. And as a result, your emissions fall from Q prime to Q double prime. Now, uh, if we change the tax to a subsidy, this is the situation. And that may uh, surprise you, right? Now, the two graphs are identical, except that the graphics are every so slightly different. Uh, but in both cases, emissions uh, fall from Q prime to Q double prime. Uh, the reason is uh, as follows, and that is that subsidies are a double negative tax. Um, so if there is an emissions tax and you increase your emissions, you pay more tax. And that is bad for you and therefore you don't do it. If there is a subsidy and you increase your emissions, you get less subsidy you forego a subsidy. Now, a subsidy is a negative tax, 
for to forego is the negative of to get and therefore taxes and subsidies have the same effect at the margin in the short run if you reduce your taxes you pay if you re reduce your emissions you pay less tax that's good you get more subsidy that's good if you increase your taxes if you increase your emissions you pay more tax that is bad you forego a subsidy that is bad right so the effect on environmental emissions is the same um, now the um, <coughs> the budget implications are different, right? In one case, the money goes from the polluters to the government, in the case of taxes. In the case of subsidies, the money goes from the government to uh, the polluters, right? So the distributional implications are not the same. Money is shifted around. But in the short run, the effect is the same. In the long run, because of this redistribution, the effect is actually the opposite. Um, and for that, we need not to look at the total private gains and the marginal private gains, but we actually need to look at the average private gains. Um, and that is the dotted line that you see here. Uh, because it's the average gains that drive the returns to uh, investment. And if you pay a tax on your polluting activity, then you make less money overall, right? So your average gains fall. If instead you get a subsidy, you're actually making more money and your average private gains increase right now if your private gains on average fall that means you have less return on investment a lower return on investment and that means that you would invest less in the polluting sector if your private gains on average increase then so do your returns on investment and you would actually invest more in the polluting sector so in the short run, taxes and subsidies reduce emissions. But in the long run, taxes reduce the size of the polluting activities, reduce the size of the polluting companies, the polluting sector, whereas subsidies increase investment, attract more investment into the polluting activity and grow the polluting sector. Right? So in the long run, taxes and subsidies work in the opposite uh, directions and that is because the of the redistribution of money <clears throat> right subsidies are of course much more popular with particularly populist uh, politicians right because instead of imposing taxes which everybody hates they're giving away money which everybody loves and nobody quite seems to realize that they're not giving away money, right? They're raising taxes to give away money, right? They're not giving away their money, they're giving away your money. Uh, but that is always lost in the heat of the moment and everybody thinks subsidies yippee. And uh, the uh, clearest example uh, of this we currently see in the United States where uh, <clears throat> It was actually uh, Boos the Younger who tried to introduce a carbon tax in the United States and Boos the, uh, no, it was Boos the Elder who tried to introduce a carbon tax in the United States and uh, Clinton tried to do this and Boos the uh, Younger tried to do this and Obama tried to do this, Trump did not try to do this uh, and Biden did not try to do this but instead gave large subsidies and got this through uh, Congress without any problem whatsoever, right? So for 25 years they tried to introduce a carbon tax or something similar, never worked, and then Biden switched to carbon subsidies and everybody thinks he is great and he definitely passed the Inflation Reduction Act that has nothing to do with inflation reduction, right? Um, 
So yes, subsidies are very popular, but also, no, please don't use them. Um, so let's look at uh, the third uh, instrument, uh, tradable uh, permits. So how do tradable permits uh, work? Um, we begin by setting an overall cap on emissions. Let's say we agree that not, much, not more than 100 million tons of sulfur should be emitted this year, right? Um, so that is where uh, it starts. Um, then, as a second step, each emitter of sulfur, in this case, gets a certain amount of permits and say, you are only allowed to emit 10 million tons and you are allowed to emit 12 million tons and so on and so forth until the 100 million ton budget is exhausted, right? Now, so far, this is direct regulation, right? Everybody has an emission standard, essentially. <clears throat> um, but then uh, the tradable part kicks in. If a company thinks it has too few of these permits, it can go to another company and buy some of theirs. It can buy the permits from a company that thinks that it has too many of these permits. Right? Uh, so that is, uh, in a nutshell, the idea behind tradable emission uh, permits. Um, and that works something as follows. Uh, let's assume that we have two firms, a firm in which it is relatively expensive to reduce emissions, and for some reason that is in green. Uh, and we have a firm in which it is relatively cheap uh, to uh, reduce emissions, and that firm is in red. The reason that I paused is my convention is always the other way around. Um, and we start by saying, well, you are allowed to emit so much, and that amount is the same for both, right? The allotted amount Q1 is equal to the allotted amount Q2. Uh, and that means that at the margin, uh, firm 2 pays uh, P2, uh, that's the price for its emission reduction or the marginal cost for its emission reduction and firm one pays P1. And obviously this violates the Baumol condition, right? We have different costs at the margin. So what would uh, permit trade do? Well, essentially firm two, no, firm one would say, well, my emission reduction costs are actually quite high what if I do a little bit less and I pay you, firm two, to do a little bit more? Right? That is essentially what permit trade is about. Uh, the expensive firm wants to move its emission reduction. Uh, the expensive firm wants to move closer to the origin, wants to move to zero. Uh, and in return, because the total emission cap stays the same, in return, firm two has to move uh, in the opposite direction, has to move to the right, and has to cut its emissions further. Uh, and they will continue to do so. <clears throat> so at this point, firm one is prepared to pay, say, 100, and firm two says, well, if you give me 70, I will do more, right? And that bargaining continues until we reach this point where firm one is not prepared to pay firm two more so that firm one does less and firm two does more, right? And firm two does not accept that agreement. Importantly, uh, firm <coughs> one moves as much to the left as firm two is moving to the right. The total cap on emissions stays the same, but we reshuffle it between uh, companies. Um, <clears throat> now, if the permit market uh, is perfect, then everybody pays the same price at the margin, and we satisfy the one more criterion, right? I'll get back uh, to that. Does this work in practice? And the answer is yes. Uh, the <coughs> oldest um, example of a large-scale uh, market in emission permits uh, was started in 1990 
uh, in the United States uh, under Title IV of the Clean Air uh, Amendments. It was actually a bill that was originally signed by uh, Nixon, uh, but it was amended in 1990, and it capped sulfur emissions of power generators, the dirtiest 263 in uh, the United States. <clears throat> um, and it started with a relatively small number to try the market, and then uh, others were included. Uh, monitoring is uh, not at all free. Uh, these are big power plants, and in order to measure how much sulfur comes out, you actually need to install uh, a unit uh, that will cost you $124,000 uh, uh, per year. Um, <clears throat> um, and that's, of course, important to keep that in mind, that you cannot just look at a flue gas and say, oh, there's so much sulfur in. You actually need to properly monitor that and that costs uh, substantial uh, money. Um, <clears throat> every unit has got its own cap, but they were allowed to trade uh, freely. And this was fairly uh, effective. Yeah, this is a somewhat older picture. Um, the uh, black dots are the actual sulfur emissions. And uh, what you see is that they fell from above 10 million tons of sulfur uh, dioxide per year to slightly below six, right? So that's a 40% emission reduction. Uh, and that should be compared to the death line that you see at the very top. That was before the program was introduced, the best guess of what emissions would do. The best guess was actually that emissions would stay roughly uh, around uh, the 10 million increased ever so slightly, but instead they fell to uh, six. Um, um, and they're projected to fall further, right? That's what this line says. Actually, this graph, as you see, is very old. Uh, 2010 is in the far future uh, in this graph. <clears throat> uh, so this is overall, uh, this is the position of individual uh, power plants. Uh, <coughs> ranked from uh, small to large. The thick line that you see are their emission allocations. What they got at the start of the year, this is how much sulfur you are allowed to emit. Actually per uh, kilowatt hour uh, of electricity generated, um, or BTU, it's almost the same thing. And then the dotted lines that you see are the actual emission permits surrendered. So the way this works is that at the start of the fiscal year, you get a certain amount of emission permits. And at the end of the fiscal year, you need to surrender your permits. And the amount of permits that you surrender must be equal to the amount of, permit, uh, the amount of emissions that you, uh, the amount of sulfur that you emitted in that year, right? That's how uh, it works. And that's why you need those monitors, right? Um, if the uh, dotted column is above the allotment, then this is a firm that bought permits from others. Uh, and if it's below, then it's a firm that sold uh, them, right? And the difference between the uh, dotted columns and the solid line adds up to zero, right? The market uh, clears. Um, <clears throat> this is um, one of the more interesting uh, findings. Um, <clears throat> the uh, lines that you see here are the observed prices of permits. This was traded on an open market, uh, so you can just observe the price. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Diamonds that you see here are the forecasted prices. And what you see is that the actual emission reduction cost was much lower at the margin uh, than the forecasted emission reduction cost. Um, and that has two uh, interpretations. One is that the models that are used to make these forecasts sort of did not count on the human ingenuity of the engineers who were running power plants. Uh, 
that actually once they were, this cap was placed on them, it turned out that it was much cheaper to reduce sulfur emissions than anybody had thought. That is definitely uh, one interpretation. Another interpretation is that the initial estimates were sort of pumped up by lobbyists who were against introducing this legislation because it would be so costly. Um, but uh, I, I think that the explanation that you see here, that it was these models are actually fairly pessimistic about how clever people really are and what sort of new technologies are available than uh, most people uh, thought. Um, this graph is, or three graphs, um, are the hardest to explain, but actually the most insightful. <laughs> Um, what you're looking at are the bid and demand curves for the first three years, 1993, 1994, and 1995. And what you see in 1995 is that the bid curve is uh, essentially uh, vertical and the ask curve is essentially horizontal or the other way around, right? Um, whereas in 1993, you see that both have a slope. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, this means that in 1993, people were actually not quite sure what to pay for permits. And you see a wide range of bids coming in. Some people were prepared to pay, uh, that must be 200, uh, for a permit to emit a ton of sulfur. Uh, and other people were prepared to pay only 50 or even less, only 10 for the same permit, right? Sulfur is sulfur is sulfur, and a sulfur permit is a sulfur permit. So the buyers weren't quite sure about the value of this thing. Uh, and similarly, the sellers, <clears throat> some were prepared to sell low, some were, pre were actually asking for quite a lot of money. And nobody was really sure what the value of these permits was or what. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the price would be, right? Uh, so that is true for 1993, top left. 1994, you see the curves flatten uh, and steepen. Uh, and in 1995, there is no variation in the market anymore. So within two years, everybody in the sulfur permit market could with a fair degree of accuracy, predict the permit price for that year. There was perfect, not perfect, close enough to perfect information in the market, right? It took only two years to get from a situation where nobody quite knew what was going on to everybody able to predict the price for this year and know how much to bid and know how much to ask. <clears throat> um, which is quite astounding that the market actually came close to perfection in two years. Uh, it's another thing uh, that happened in, at the start when this new legislation was introduced, consultants made a killing, right? Because everybody was uncertain, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? Uh, and then consultants step in and tell them, I know, right? They don't, but they sound very confident. And some of you will work as uh, consultants in the near future, and you will need to sound very confident, right? You know, um, <coughs> even if you don't. Uh, and also we saw a lot of uh, intermediaries uh, in the permit trade. Within two years, that entire business dried up and uh, all the companies were doing it uh, by uh, themselves. Um, now, the success of uh, this particular program, early 1990s um, in the United States, explains why these permit markets have proliferated uh, across the world and are introduced for all sorts of everything uh, in all sorts of uh, countries, including uh, for CO2, but not just uh, greenhouse gases. <coughs> Okay, 23 minutes left. Um, last week I talked about Beaumont. Here you see him uh, again. 
uh, and his criterion for cost effectiveness, right? And what I said was, if we have a cost function where M is emission reduction, and we want to minimize the total cost, uh, let's do it uh, like this, we want to minimize the total cost of emission reduction, but make sure that our the sum of our individual emission reduction adds up at least to our target, then form the Lagrangian, solve it, what we have as the first order condition for cost effectiveness is that the cost of emission reduction at the margin for all polluters N should be equal to the shadow price of the constraint and the shadow price of the constraint is equal for everybody at the cost effective solution the marginal costs of emission reduction are equalized across the economy. <clears throat> Right, that is something we did uh, last week. Now let's consider the case where there is a tax on emissions. Uh, then the private cost function has a new element and recall that M is emission reduction. Uh, if you reduce your emissions more, you pay less tax. Uh, if the tax is T, then your cost function changes by adding minus T M sub N at the end. <clears throat> now, if you're a cost minimizer, a uh, rational producer, and you want to solve this particular problem, this is an unconstrained optimization, so no faff with Lagrangians or anything, you just set uh, the uh, <coughs> first partial derivative of your cost function, your objective function, uh, to the thing that you're deciding on, emissions, uh, equal to zero. The CDMN uh, must equal zero. Um, <clears throat> so this is still beta, this is still uh, gamma M, and then this becomes a minus T, right? That must be equal to zero. This is the marginal cost of emission reduction. Bring T to the other side of the equation. If you impose a tax, <clears throat> and the tax is the same for everybody, then you equate the cost of emission reduction at the margin across your polluters, right? So with a uniform tax, you automatically get to a cost-effective solution. <clears throat> um, and that is because if you reduce emissions, tax falls, and so cost falls. That is why we changed the cost function the way we did. Now let's look at a subsidy, right? <clears throat> With a subsidy, you get money for your emissions, for your emission reduction, for your M, and therefore your costs fall. So in that case, we need to subtract not minus TM from our costs, but we should subtract minus SM from our costs. <clears throat> Nothing has changed, right? If we then set the first partial derivative equal to zero, what we have is that the marginal costs uh, for all polluters should equal S rather than T. So also with a subsidy, you get automatically to a cost-effective solution. <clears throat> Now, what happens with tradable permits? And uh, it's a little bit more involved. Um, essentially, if you're a permit seller, then you get more revenue for every unit of emission reduction. You have more permits to sell, and your costs fall. And if the price of permits is P, uh, then your costs fall by minus P, right? If instead you are a permit buyer, then for every unit that you reduce more, you have to buy fewer permits on the market, just as you would have to pay less tax if you reduce your emissions more. And therefore, also if you're a permit buyer, you should subtract P, M, N from your uh, cost function. <clears throat> and again, if you then take the first partial derivative to our emission reduction, M, we find that the marginal cost should equal not T, not S, but should equal P, right? So taxes, subsidies, tradable permits leads to an equation of the costs of emission reduction at the margin 
they satisfy the von Moore criteria. Um, <clears throat> right? I'm actually going to make it. Um, so, um, let's look at the trade off between taxes and uh, permits. Uh, so, I compare taxes and subsidies. They work the same in the short run, but have the opposite in the long run. Uh, are taxes and, uh, taxes and tradable permits the same? In other words, for tradable permits is cap and trade, and that's what you see here. Um, <clears throat> So uh, taxes and tradable permits are similar in that they both reduce emissions, uh, both equate abatement costs at the margin, uh, and if tradable permits are auctioned, then they also bring revenue to the government. There's essentially two ways of allocating tradable permits. One is to give them away for free, and the other is to buy them to the highest bidder in an auction, and the, uh, the second option is actually recommended. <clears throat> um, and you may think, therefore, that taxes and tradable permits are the same, and definitely that taxes and auction tradable permits are the same. But you would be wrong uh, in thinking that. Thalia gives up. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it was a joke. Um, <laughs> the difference lies in uncertainty and certainty. If you use um, tradable permits, <clears throat> uh, if you use taxes, sorry, that's what I should do first, then you actually don't know what the effect on the environment would be. You know that if you impose a tax, then emissions are going to fall. But you only know by how much if you know people's marginal cost curve, marginal emission reduction cost curve, right? Which is private information. And definitely, if you're talking about complex uh, environmental problems, then you don't know that. And we call the sulfur curve, <coughs> which is actually a, a good bit uh, in the past. <coughs> This is what the government thought emission reduction costs would be, and this is what they actually were, right? So you don't know this as a regulator. <clears throat> um, what you do know if you impose a tax is what the costs at the margin would be, because that is what you imposed, right? So an environmental tax buys certainty in the economy but at the expense of uncertainty in the environment, right? <clears throat> uh, tradable permits are the exact opposite. With tradable permits, you know exactly how much stuff will be emitted, because that is the overall cap that you imposed. But you can't predict the price in advance. So you don't know the economic effects. So taxes and tradable permits sort of are their mirror image in uncertainty, right? In one, you know the economic effects, but not the environmental effects. In the other, you know the environmental effects, but not the economic effects. So then the question is, which of the two is more important? Um, and the answer to that is the Weizmann Theorem, and here you see uh, an older uh, Marty uh, Weizmann. <clears throat> so, let's set up our cost-benefit diagram again, right? <clears throat> so, we have marginal damages, we have marginal costs of emission reduction. The optimum is to either impose a tax P star or impose an overall cap Q star, right? That's what you do. Quantity instrument, price instrument. And the two are equivalent under uh, Samuelson. Now assume that the government is lobbied by industry and industry has convinced uh, the government that the abatement costs are not the brown curve here, but really it's more expensive to reduce emissions. And the government believes that the curve is instead the red one that you see here. <clears throat> now, what would happen if the government believes 
where the red curve is through rather than the brown curve, well, with a <coughs> quantity instrument, it's actually more expensive to cut the emissions, so we should be a bit more lenient. They would be under regulation, right? We shift from Q star to Q prime, and we allow for more emissions because it's so expensive to cut emissions. <coughs> But if the government were to use a tax instrument, a price instrument, and I would actually say, <laughs> I'm still going to pick the social optimum, right? Even if we don't know where this curve lies, um, and we're going to impose a tax P prime, and we're going to over-regulate the market. Right? So my story about lobbyists doesn't hold, right? If you are an environmentalist and you think that the government is going to impose a tax, then you should convince, try and convince them that emission reduction is actually very expensive, right? Um, <coughs> now, what is the welfare loss of this under-regulation with uh, a quantity instrument with tradable permits? Well, the environment uh, loses by this amount here, right? Uh, the uh, industry gains by this amount here because they have to work hard, less hard, and the difference is the blue triangle uh, that you see here, right? That is the welfare loss of underregulation. If you overregulate, then um, there is an environmental gain that is the area under the green curve but there's an economic loss, that's the area under the brown curve, and that is the pink triangle that you see here. That's the welfare loss of overregulation with a tax. <clears throat> now, from where you're sitting, there is a distributional effect, right? You shift the burden from the environment to the polluters or the other way around, but the two triangles have the same size. And that is not an optical illusion. The triangles have the same size, right? And it's not your eyesight. Um, that is truly the case. But what happens if the marginal damage curve is steeper than uh, it is depicted here? Then the following situation emerges. Actually, if the marginal damage cost curve steepens, then the difference between Q star and Q prime shrinks. And the difference between uh, P star and P prime grows, right? And as a result, the blue triangle shrinks and the pink triangle grows. And if the marginal damage cost curve is steeper than it was in the original picture, then the welfare loss of under-regulation with a quantity instrument is much less severe than the welfare loss with over-regulation with a price instrument. And uh, vice versa, if you make the green curve, the damage cost curve, uh, shallower, then the blue triangle grows, and the difference between Q star and Q prime grows, and the difference between P star and P prime shrinks, as does the pink triangle, as does the welfare loss of the under overregulation with a tax instrument. Right? That is the Weizmann theorem. Actually, the condition uh, for the two triangles, the two welfare losses to be equal in size is that the brown curve and the green curve are equally steep. And if they are, if they have the same slope, but of course with opposite sign, and then the two welfare losses of overregulation with one instrument and underregulation with the other instrument are equal. Right? So in words, um, if the environment, if the marginal damage cost curve is less steep than the marginal abatement cost curve, uh, 
then mistakes with price instruments, that is taxes, are less costly than our mistakes with quantity instruments, tradable permits, and vice versa if the uh, marginal damage cost curve is steeper than the marginal abatement cost curve, then mistakes with quantity instruments, tradable permits, are less costly than our mistakes with price instruments. So essentially what the Weizmann theorem does is my starting point taxes by economic certainty but get you environmental uncertainty tradable permits get you environmental certainty but get you economic uncertainty and depending on the steepness of the marginal of the marginal damages to the environment one may be costlier than the other. That is essentially what the Weizmann theorem says. Um, <clears throat> and um, essentially with a tax, you know the economic effects, right? So if that is important to you, then that is what you should go to. If you're I can only do this with climate. Sorry, I had the promise not to talk about climate, but let's talk about climate, right? So, climate change is caused by the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere over decades and centuries, and really what matters are CO2 emissions from the whole world. It doesn't really matter whether emissions come from China or from the United Kingdom, the effect on climate is the same. It doesn't matter where the CO2 comes from. So if you use a tax, then you know in the United Kingdom, then you know for certain what the economic, almost certain what the economic effects on the United Kingdom would be. But you don't know what the climate effects would be. But then again, if you're sort of in between two elections and you're controlling the United uh, Kingdom or think you are in control of the United Kingdom, um, it doesn't really matter if you get your emissions a little bit wrong. Right? Because climate change depends on the accumulation of emissions over decades from all countries in the world. So if you as a parliament get your emissions a little bit wrong, it doesn't. That's no biggie, right? So the environmental uncertainty is actually not worth a whole lot. But the economic uncertainty, if you very rapidly increase your energy prices, I don't need to remind this audience in uh, early 2023 that rapid en energy price shocks are not good for an economy, right? We have all experienced that over the last uh, year or so. So in that sort of cases, go for the taxes because the economic uncertainty is much more important than the environmental uncertainty. Um, <coughs> If, on the other hand, you're talking about relatively trivial economic problems where you can take away the emissions at a very low cost, but you really don't know what the environment would do, and if you get it wrong, then uh, all sorts of disasters may happen, then really you would want to buy environmental certainty and don't care much about the economic uh, uncertainty, right? And one example would be um, the replacement of CFCs by HFCs. CFCs cause a hole in the ozone layer, and HFCs do not. Now, the hole in the ozone layer is a very scary thing. We know uh, some of the effects for certain. We know that it causes skin cancer, and that is uh, something that scares people, uh, but we also know that the UVB radiation that comes through the hole in the, radio, uh, in the ozone layer also changes DNA and can sort of lead to a cascade of unknown environmental and ecological effects. Uh, it's actually quite scary. Do you really want to run the risk if you know at the same time that replacing CFCs by HFCs will add 20% to the cost of refrigeration and that's it, right? And you say, well, 20% is quite a lot, but then you realize refrigeration is actually pretty small in the overall uh, cost. So, yeah, we don't really care about the economic uncertainty, and nobody knows whether it's 20% or 15% or 25%, right? But that is trivial 
whereas the economic or the environmental consequences are potentially disastrous. So in that case, you would say, well, I'm going to buy the environmental certainty at the expense of economic uncertainty, and I'm going to go for tradable permits, right? So really, it is not the case that taxes and tradable permits are the same, and you can really not just say, well, they are different, but you can also say in what circumstances one is better than the other.